Hi and welcome to the first night of our online mission here in our North Irish district. We're so glad that you have taken the time to tune in and we look forward to this special week of outreach. We encourage you to share it on Facebook and with others that you may know. Tonight we are very glad to have Wesley Brewer who works with the Faith Mission in England, sharing from God's Word. We also have Calvin Park, a second year student at the Faith Mission Bible College in Edinburgh, who will be sharing his personal story, how he came to faith in the Lord Jesus as his own Saviour. And then we also have the Brook Quartet from Balamina here, who will be sharing in song shortly. Just now, I'm going to pray for these folk. Father, we thank you for the talents that you have given to each of us as your children to use for your glory. We pray for Calvin, for Wesley, and for the Brook Quartet just now as they come to share with us that you will bless their ministry and that you will speak to each of us through it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hi, I'm Calvin. Uh, I have been asked to share my testimony with you, uh, how God has saved me and what he has done uh, in my life. So I was brought up in a, a Christian home, two Christian parents, one from Scotland, my dad, uh, and one from Northern Ireland, my mum. I was born in the south of England and raised uh, up in the north, in Leeds, in the north of England. Um, so to say I'm from the south would be deeply offensive. So don't say I'm from the south of England. Uh, but there you are, that's where I'm from. I'm 23 years old um, and I'm at studying at uh, the Faith Mission Bible College uh, at the minute. I'm in my second year, I've nearly finished. So there you are. Um, I became a Christian uh, at the age of four. God saved me uh, then. Um, my mum and dad, as I said, both Christians brought me up knowing the Bible, brought me up knowing that God loved me. Uh, knowing that I was sinful and I needed a saviour. At the age of four, God saved me and that's when I became a Christian. But growing up, you start to realise fully what that means and how to live as a Christian. Uh, and um, it's not always easy being a Christian. There's always temptations to go your own way and do what you want to do. Um, and that would really be the story of my life up until now. Um, the line from come thou fount, uh, prone to wander, Lord I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That would uh, really be true for me uh, growing up uh, as, as a Christian. Um, one of those things was football, I loved football. Uh, I watched it all the time, I played it all the time. Um, and it was really growing up, it kind of took over my life and was the centre of my life. Um, I'd say I was a Christian growing up. I would identify as a Christian. Uh, I loved God and he loved me, but football just started to take over. It was the center of my life uh, and Christ and Jesus wasn't. Um, and around the age of 13, 14, maybe I was playing for Leeds United and I was doing well. I thought, oh, here we go. I can make a career out of this. I've become a footballer as many people believe at a young age. Um, and I'd started messing around. I thought, that was it. I've made it. This is my life. This is what I'm going to do. My dad told me a couple of weeks before I got released and kicked out that I need to book up my ideas. Otherwise, I get kicked out. Uh, and of course, I didn't listen, did I? Um, got kicked out. And I started to blame God for that. Rather than blaming my actions and, and what I as like it was a result of my actions and what I had done, I started to blame God. Um and throughout my teenage years, there was that inside me wrestling with God. If this is your fault, no, it's my fault. This is your fault. But it was my fault. But as I said, I blamed God up until uh, I went to a, a a REACH conference at the age of 17. I went there and the guy was uh, speaking about Jesus' last days on earth and uh, how he uh, suffered abuse, both physical and verbal, uh, how he was whipped uh, and more importantly, how he went to the cross and died for me. He died for me and he died for you. And um, He just brought the gospel to me once again and showed me the beauty of the gospel. Uh, and that God um, humbled himself uh, down to earth to die for a sinner like me. Um, and it was a real wake-up call there at the age of 17. Of This is what God has done for me. God has died for me. Um, who am I to blame him? Who am I to put blame on him for my actions? And there I had a deepened uh, relationship with God. God revealed himself to me then and showed me that he loved me and that he cared for me. Um, and God was at the centre uh, of my life. And again, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I went off to university. And there at university, they tell you lots of different things. Uh, the main thing was you need to make a career. You need to go and get something, which is which is right. It is right. You need to uh, figure out what it is you are there for. You can't be at uni forever. And I really enjoyed my time at uni. I did really grow with God and relationship with him. Um, learned about a lot of different churches, uh, how they worship God. And I just really grew uh, as a Christian and grew with my relationship with God. But it was around third year where you have to decide what it is you're going to do next I didn't know what I wanted I wanted to be a PE teacher but the buzz of that had gone and I, I knew it wasn't right uh, so I thought what is the next best thing that will get, get me a good paid job I can go off and I can have a comfortable easy life 
So I thought, well, prison officer, I'll be one of those because they get a good amount of money. So I looked at this unlocked graduate scheme and I uh, uh, had my application and everything filled out, uh, filled out uh, and I went and looked at probation officers, something along those lines where I could help people, uh, but also use sport to help people. Um, but I wasn't really seeking God's will in all of this. I wanted to own my own life. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to have a good career. I wanted to have an easy life. Um, but it wasn't until the summer where I went to Rejuvenate uh, Conference in, in Edinburgh, the youth conference at the Faith Mission Bible College, where the Lord really challenged me just to surrender all my wants, to surrender all my everything to him. Uh, the wants of having an easy life, the wants of having a career, the wants of um, just having complete control over my life. The Lord really challenged me to just let it go and to give it all to him and to surrender to his will. So I did that on that week. Uh, I prayed and I asked God to help me to show his will with a friend who was also challenged that week. Um, and slowly but surely over that week, the Lord was challenging me to apply to Bible college with the hopes of uh, going and spreading the gospel to people through the use of sport, through the use of football predominantly. So the Lord had challenged me to do that. Uh, and he challenged me to go to the Faith Mission Bible College where my mum and dad went. And I really didn't want to do that. I really didn't want to do that. But um, that's what the Lord wanted. Uh, and I struggled and wrestled with that over the summer. Um, and it wasn't until I sat down with my parents and explained things and I think I needed to go to Bible college that they turned around and said, well, we've known for a couple of months. I said, you've known for a couple of months. Why didn't you tell me? Um, but they'd been praying and the Lord had revealed to them that uh, this is where I was going to be. Um, and they'd been praying about it uh, without me even knowing. So that was, again, just a confirmation to me that I should go off to Bible college, do the two years there and see where the Lord puts me. Um so that would be what the Lord has done uh, for me and, and how he has led me to Bible college, how he's led me to this time now, sharing my testimony with you. Uh, the, the, the end of the line, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, is here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And that is my prayer, that is my testimony, that um, I just want to follow God's will and, and God's plan for my life. Um, and he's really given me the passion to spread the gospel to people through the use of sport, through the use of football. So that is hopefully what I'll be doing in the future. But who knows, apart from the Lord. So I need to follow the Lord's will. So that's my testimony and what the Lord has done for me. Thanks for listening.
Well, it's great to be with you today. What I want to do is I want to just read to you a very short verse, a very well-known verse, probably the most well-known verse uh, in the Old Testament, uh, and that is from Psalm 23. And we're just going to be looking at verse 1. And it reads like this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Most of you will probably know this psalm. Most of you probably memorise this psalm. Now, if you do have a Bible, do turn to it. If not, don't worry. We're just going to work our way through this psalm and we're going to just be taking a word by word approach and seeing what we can see of the character of God and, and how that applies to us. So firstly, we see the two words here, uh, the Lord. This is the Lord, not a Lord, not one of many Lords, but this is the Lord. There is only one God. There isn't many gods there isn't a god but there is only one god the god and who is this god well notice how the lord is spelled capital l capital o capital r capital d uh, this is uh, the triune god's name yahweh triune just meaning that, that god is three persons god the father god the son and god the holy spirit uh, one god three persons uh, and this is God's personal name, Yahweh. This isn't the Father's name, this isn't the Son's name, and this isn't the Holy Spirit's name. This is God's personal name. And, and actually, and not only is it his personal name, but each of his names, God has many names, uh, show us something of his characteristics of who God actually is. And this name, Yahweh, is his covenant name. This is his covenant keeping name. This teaches us that, that God is a covenant keeping God. Not only is God a covenant keeping God, but he is a covenant making God. We think of the rainbow, uh, which God uh, promised Noah that he wouldn't flood the earth again, wouldn't destroy the earth by flood and water again. Uh, and each time we look at that rainbow, we see and remember the promise God made with Noah. And we remember his faithfulness in that. We think of the Israelites as God promised uh, to deliver them out of Egypt. And then what does he say to Joshua when they're in the, the wilderness? I will not leave you nor will I forsake you. And did God? He didn't. God delivered them not only out of Egypt but into the promised land. Defeated the Canaanites and gave them the promised land you see God is a covenant making God and is a covenant keeping God what does Joshua 21 say not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed every one was fulfilled Psalm 89 says this verse 34 my covenant will I not break nor alter the things that Go out of my lips. You see, we can trust God because he's a covenant keeping God. What he says is what he does. We can take refuge in that. Actually, if you see what Jesus says in John chapter 6 and verse 37. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And if you're a true Christian here uh, listening today, you can cling to that. You can cling to God uh, that he does not break his promises. He will not leave you nor will he forsake you. He will not cast you out. But he will deliver you. He will deliver you uh, to glory. We have security in that. We have security in, in the character of God. We have security in God's covenant keeping us. We have actually an anchor you could say in the covenants of God. We have a covenant of grace. A far superior covenant to the previous one. We have a covenant of grace and we have a covenant that, that God has promised he will return. So when the, the waves of life will toss us around, when the uncertainty of 2021 comes and we don't know what that will look like, we can take refuge and fix our anchor within the character of God and not only in the character of God but that he is a covenant keeping God. Whatever we may face, whatever life throws at us, however afraid, frustrated, 
saddened uh, and bitter or, or fed up we may be and may become, we can take refuge and courage and strength from knowing that God is a covenant keeping God. We can be st stand fast and immovable in this. We can, be, we can take comfort of this very thing, that which he hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When the world is changing and we don't know uh, where this political unrest will end up, we see uh, nations falling and rising and we wonder what on earth is happening. We can take refuge and strength in knowing that the covenant keeping God, not only uh, is he a covenant keeping God, but he is one that reigns. It wouldn't be very good if we worshipped a God that was a covenant keeping God, but he was defeated. But our God reigns and he reigns on high and we can take refuge in that. Notice what the next word says. The next word is, is. The Lord is my shepherd. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say the Lord was my shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord could be my shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord possibly, maybe, one day might be my shepherd. But it says the Lord is my shepherd. You see, all of Psalm 23 is in the present tense. You see, here we see the eternal faithfulness of God. Moving on to my next word is my, but we're just going to pick up on my in a moment. What I want to look at just before that is the word shepherd, because that will help us to understand the word my after that. The Lord is my shepherd. If God is our shepherd, then obviously by implication we are, as Christians, the sheep. We are the sheep of his pastures. And if you are a Christian, you are a sheep. And why are we sheep? Why are we not cattle? We well, see cattle are driven. Sheep follow. Sheep follow Christ. But sheep follow God. They follow the shepherd. But why does David say uh, that the Lord, why doesn't he say, should I say, uh, the Lord is my king or my ruler? Because kings and rulers have followers. Well, you see, for this very reason, because a shepherd is someone that lives among the sheep. A shepherd is someone uh, that isn't, doesn't reign from on high, from a distance, but a shepherd is someone that lives in a personal way with the sheep. A shepherd is someone that is responsible for the sheep. A shepherd is a, the protector of the sheep. The shepherd guards the sheep from the wild animals and the thieves that come to seek, to kill and destroy. You see, the shepherd uh, would sleep by the gate hole uh, of the pen where the sheep would stay at night. Uh, and the shepherd uh, would sleep there and protect the sheep. And if necessary, the shepherd would end up fighting uh, and trying to warn off these wild animals. And in the process, the shepherd would lay down his life sometimes for the sheep. Is your mind not drawn to the New Testament and particularly to John's Gospel in chapter 10 where it says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Here in the Gospel of John, Jesus is explaining that he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He's not only identifying with the shepherd, but he's identifying with the father. He's identifying that he is the Lord and he is the shepherd of Psalm 23. They knew Psalm 23 uh, as well as we did. Uh, and here Jesus is saying, I am that shepherd from Psalm 23. I am identifying uh, as one with the father, as one with the, uh, the Lord, the God of heaven and here as Jesus uh, is identifying as that shepherd of Psalm 23 uh, we find our answer uh, to the second line of verse 1 I shall not want why shall I not want because the good shepherd has laid down his life for me here we see the sufficiency of the cross 
You see, the cross is sufficient for salvation. What Christ has done on the cross of Calvary was sufficient for salvation. We don't need to rely upon anything else. We don't need to reply, rely on anything we can do, anything we can add. It's not Christ and something else, but it's Christ alone. Through his death and resurrection, we have salvation. It's, there's nothing more we can add to obtain salvation. There's nothing more we can do to be more righteous in God's eyes. Because it's paid for at the cross by Jesus Christ. We see in Psalm 22, uh, we see the death of Christ and we see the resurrection of Christ. We see the work of Christ and then we see the work of Christ in Psalm 23 in his priestly work. As Christ is our great high priest, he's our good shepherd. And when the serpent of old, the devil himself, comes before the father... And, and comes before God the Father, they're accusing the Christian of, of things he has done. There Jesus can say, it's paid for in full by my precious blood. This is why we shall not want. Because we have everything in Christ. We have everything we need or could desire in Christ. If I can bring us back to that fourth word of, of Psalm uh, 23 uh, and verse 1. My, the Lord is my shepherd. You could, you could argue that this is the most important word uh, in this verse. Here we see that God is a personal God. Here we see that God delights in having a personal relationship uh, with people. But if you're not a Christian... You cannot say this verse. You cannot say the Lord is my shepherd. Because the Lord is not your shepherd. Jesus is not your good shepherd. You shall want. Not only shall you want, but you will lack everything. You may have material riches. You may have physical health. You may have everything the world can offer you. But if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. If you don't know the shepherd in a personal way, you have nothing. If you don't have a good shepherd to tend and look after your soul. The Bible speaks about when you die. It says it is appointed once a man to die and then the judgment. You come before God and you can bring all your money. You can bring all your, your riches uh, and all your good deeds, all your sacrifices. But he will come before you as judge and you will find that you lack everything. You will find you lack the most important thing, the only thing that can get you into heaven. You lack Christ's righteousness. You see, Christ's righteousness is given to the sheep upon believing that uh, whosoever believes upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If we believe in Christ and in what he has done, we receive Christ's righteousness. We are, what the Bible speaks of, is being justified. We become legally right in God's eyes and we are granted a place in heaven. But if you don't know Christ, you don't have a place granted for you in heaven but you say how do I become uh, a follower of the shepherd how do I become a, uh, the sheep how do I follow Christ well very simply you put your faith and trust in what he has done and in what he uh, Christ has accomplished in in God becoming man living a sinless spotless life achieving what we couldn't achieve in a blameless, sinless life, dying in our place, taking the punishment we truly and rightly deserved, then rising again on that third day, defeating death, conquering the grave. Forty days later, he ascends into heaven. And what you do is you ask God to forgive you. 
you put your faith and trust in what Jesus has done and what he has accomplished. Ask God to forgive you. Follow him. And he is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. And he will clothe you in Christ's righteousness. You will be justified. So there's just a few thoughts. But just to sort of finish with. We have seen the Lord is one God. Made up of three persons. The God is a, is a triune God. He's a covenant keeping God. He's a faithful God. He's a personal God. He's a caring God. He's a generous God. And he's the God of salvation. And this is what this verse is showing us. That if you're a Christian, you can take security and comfort in knowing that your God reigns. And that in a hopeless time, that you can take comfort in who he is and what he has done. And if you're not a Christian, my prayer is that you've seen the need not to look to your own abilities, not to look to what you have achieved, not to look to uh, anything that you could inherit, not to look to your parents' religion or whatever that may be, but to look to Christ, the author and perfecter of faith, there's only him that can give you salvation. So my prayer is that you would look to him, turn to him, and by faith, by trusting in him, you will obtain salvation. You will ask God to forgive you. And he's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness and to cleanse you from all sin.